Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Barry Norman. I'm the head counselor at Expert Admissions, and I'm joined by two great guests um, for this month's webinar. We're talking about summer pre-college programs. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves in a couple of moments, but as people are queuing into the room, um, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you have, we got questions from people. Thank you so much for the many questions that were submitted in advance. If you have any questions for our guests or for me as we're chatting, please put them in the Q&A section. Uh, better than the chat, I'll try to keep up with both, but I'll definitely be watching the Q&A and we'll try to answer ones and incorporate anything um, as we're talking. And um, and yeah, we're excited to be talking about summer as the, the winter is approaching and as the temperatures are dropping for those those of us in uh, in the parts of the country where um, where it's uh, it's changing seasons. So, without further ado, um, I'm going to ask our guests to introduce themselves. Um, and if we could start with Peter, uh, let's let's start with you and and uh, and thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you, Barry. Thanks to Expert Admissions for putting this together. You all run a great organization, and we get a lot of students who uh, come to you and and work with you to make sure they get into a college that makes sense for them. So you do good work. I'm delighted to be here, delighted to be with Lauren Moore as well. Uh, I'm Peter Shumlin, I'm one of the directors of Public Student Travel. Uh, we have for the last 72 years sent educational summer programs, including pre-college programs all over the world. Uh, I, we're now a third generation organization, but truthfully Putney is 35 people who work out of an old converted cow barn in Vermont to change students' lives in the summertime. My parents founded it. Their dream was to turn summer into education, and we've been doing it ever since. So I've had a variety of uh, roles in my life, but one of them that brings me the most pleasure is helping with admissions and directing public student travel. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. And a winner for best background, Lauren, already with the Christmas tree up. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit about you and, uh, and Morton. Absolutely, it is the season. Uh, so I'm Lauren Moore. I am director of high school programs with Wharton Global Youth. Uh, Wharton Global Youth is a division of the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, located in Philadelphia, PA. Um, we offer a portfolio of programming and courses, competitions, activities, and uh, content and educational resources for high school students and high school educators. Um, I think today we're primarily here to talk about programming. I've been leading programming on Penn's campus for 16 years now. Um, it is very near and dear to my heart. We have some amazing opportunities ranging in non-credit, for credit, two to four weeks, really phenomenal opportunities for high school students who are interested in business and interested in dipping their toes in the college going experience. Thank you. And uh, and yes, we we uh, very intentionally picked these two programs to join us for this conversation because of the range and the breadth of programming that they do and because it's substantive, good programming. Um, there's a lot of summer programs out there and um, not all of them are necessarily helpful to students in their, in their process of figuring out what they're interested in, in their process of building up their profile for college admissions. And so we're really delighted to have you both and we'll definitely be getting into specifics about each of your programs um, in a couple of moments. I did wanna start with one of the questions that came in um, a fair, a fairly frequently and, um, and it's more general. There were questions about about each program and there were also some questions more related to pre-college and summer programming um, as they connect to college admissions and I'll certainly be addressing those pieces but I think one of the most popular questions we got was just the the question about um, programs that people pay for and whether or not those are becoming um, less important or looked at differently um, you know, in the context of the college admissions process. And I think it's a good question and I'm glad that people brought it up and I think it's important to start with that. My experience always has been, um, and from recent years, you know, up to last year and, and even in the early decision stuff that we've seen in early action uh, decisions that we've already seen this year, but really always is that it depends on what you're doing. So just because you pay for a program doesn't mean that it's looked down upon um, because it wasn't some super selective program that um, 
you know, that, that there's no money involved or no, no payment made. Um, it really is about how substantive is the program? What kind of experience are you getting? What are you going to get out of it? You can go to the most selective program that doesn't cost anything. And if you go and all you have to say at the end is what you did, I worked in a lab and this is what I did, and you didn't really get more than that out of it, it doesn't necessarily matter. So I, I always encourage people to focus on the content and the substance of the program as it relates to your larger profile and what your goals are for college. You know, there's different expectations about how high you need to take your extracurricular or co-curricular interests, depending on what your goals are, and then make the decision from there. Um, but I see, I've never seen um, any issue so long as the program is relevant and substantive and the student will be able to communicate in their applications why and how it was, um, I've never seen any issue about it. So I just wanted to start with that because I think it's an important piece. And so um, let's talk about each of the programs. We have a number of different opportunities available in, in each um, in each in each uh, school slash program. And so maybe Lauren, if we could start with you, um, can you give us the range? Because you do have competitions, you do have uh, different kinds of of opportunities. Let's hear a little bit about what Wharton offers. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned competition. So I'll start with that. That is a, a free uh, global investment competition. It's open to teams of high school students between four and seven students. Um, they work with an advisor and they have a client profile. They work towards building an investment strategy and a portfolio using an online stock simulator. Um, throughout the competition, there are Meet the Experts series and webinars and chances to interact with industry professionals to really gain some insight into the finance sector and investment at large. Um, so it's a really phenomenal free opportunity. Um, and that is currently ongoing. And there will be a global finale on Penn's campus, a learning day, uh, final competition and presentations and winners. It's a really amazing opportunity. We have about 10,000 students participating this year. So it's amazing to see uh, the breadth of students who are interested in this type of content, even though it's typically not offered at the high school levels. So that's really awe-inspiring, uh, I think. Um, and then the bulk of what I do is overseeing our on-campus location-based and online summer programs. Um, so those range between two and three weeks. Uh, our traditional on-campus programs take place on Penn's Philadelphia campus. We have a variety of different themed programs. We have a program in finance, essentials of finance, program in entrepreneurship. We have a three-week leadership in the business world program. We offer a three-week program in data science, a program in sports analytics, a program in management and technology. So lots of great ways for students to experience college life, living in the dorms, eating in the dining halls, for good or bad. It goes both ways. Um, but also making new connections, meeting really phenomenal peers, learning from and with faculty, doing independent research, um, using university resources and facilities, and really, you know, becoming a, an authority figure in their own lives. So it's a really phenomenal opportunity on Penn's campus. We now offer location-based programs as well. Uh, we have a satellite campus in San Francisco, so we're offering a program in innovation and startup culture, which is a very immersive program. Um, the content and the curriculum from this program really bleeds into the city of San Francisco. Um, they do a lot of site visits to current startups. They learn from industry professionals. It's a very interactive program. Um, and we're actually launching a program in Cambridge, in the United Kingdom, this summer as well in international business, strategy, and management. So that will be a phenomenal opportunity for students to come from all over the world, learn from Wharton in a completely new space. Um, and then we offer a host of online programs as well. And these are a little different than most online programs that might be out there. Um, they really take advantage of all of the business simulations created by the Wharton School, and we have many <laughs> to choose from. So they're designed to be incredibly engaging and interactive and to make all of those live sessions truly dynamic. We offer a program called Future of the Business World, which is kind of forward thinking, landscape of business in the future. And we offer a program in Essentials of Leadership, um, which allows students to focus on social and emotional leadership skills, teamwork, collaboration. Um, so really great ways for students to build connections. 
Uh, I would say our student population is about 40% international and 60% domestic, and they really are coming from all over the United States, um, and that's for both online programs and on-campus programs. Um, and then we also offer a pre-baccalaureate dual enrollment program where students can actually take undergraduate Wharton courses for college credit. They earn a Wharton transcript. These are transferable college credits. Uh, they work with faculty. They have access to university learning resources and advising. So it's a really great way to test their content knowledge, um, pick up new skills, and get that college going experience as well. Great. Can I ask a couple of follow-up questions before we get to Putney? Okay. Um, for the for the programs um, that are in person on on Penn's campus, like leadership in the business world, sports analytics, data science, those are there any that are smaller or more selective um, than others, um, or any that are uh, significantly different in terms of level of enrollment or anything like that that students should be aware of as they are considering? Sure. So all of our programs are quite selective. Um, these are designed to be rigorous, challenging programs, not content offered at the high school level. Some do have prerequisites. Our smallest program is about 75 students, and our largest program is about 120 students. Um, we receive numerous applications from students who are interested, and our admissions criteria is fairly standard. It's a 3.3 uh, high school GPA unweighted. Um, we have a couple of essay questions students need to address, teacher or counselor recommendations. Um, we're really trying to gain a feel for what students hope to do with the skills they acquire in these programs, how they will benefit from these programs, um, and how they plan to enact everything they've learned you know, in their home communities or in the future. Um, so we receive thousands of applications for these programs. Fortunately, we have lots of programs to go around. Um, so we're usually able to find something to fit, to fit everyone's profile and interests and needs. Um, but yeah, they are, they are fairly selective programs. I would say especially our three-week leadership in the business world program. It's one of our flagship programs that's been around for 30 plus years. Um, this program... Uh, does have a slightly higher profile. It's about a 3.3 GPA, and students applying to this program need to have some type of formal and or informal leadership experience um, so that they have skills to develop and refine throughout the three weeks on campus. Great. And is do you have an admit rate for LBW or no? I do not off the top of my head, um, but I'm comfortable saying it's very selective. Sure, that's fair. Um, just wanted to know if you had anything more specific. Um, okay, we'll get to some specifics about some of those programs, but let's hear a little bit about Putney. Um, Putney also has career programs as well as um, travel programs. And so, Peter, we would love to hear a bit more about those. Sure. Well, so I'm going to talk a little about Putney and then talk a little about uh, our collaborations because they're relevant to the pre-college discussion. I appreciated Lauren's uh, presentation because I learned a lot as well. Uh, so Putney offers a variety of programs, service programs all over the world where you engage in community service and small communities where you really make a difference. They're three to four, they're generally two to four weeks. It's a very small group, 16 students, two leaders going into the community and really making connections. We have travel, we have exploration programs, which are educational travel programs. We have language programs where you're in France or Spain and you're really committed, you have to commit to speaking a language. You need at least two years of language behind you to do it. Uh, and then we have what are our career programs, which are programs that really focus on hoping that we traveling in some part of the world latch you to knowledge for a career that we think might inspire you. But I'm gonna focus a little bit on our pre-college programs because I know that that's really what we're focused on here. If you go to our website, and frankly, our website's down right now, but starting tomorrow, it'll be back up. Uh, we have programs called Oxford Academia which are directed and led by Professor James Basker, who has Barnard and, and Columbia connections and has taught there for many, many years. His story very briefly is he, he got a, a, a scholarship to Harvard as a young guy for his BA. He was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford for both his, uh, his, his master's and, and, and Cambridge uh, for his master's and PhD, he taught there for years. And he has been directing high school programs at Oxford for over 40 years. His quality is unparalleled in my view. 
One reason is that he's on a Rhodes Scholar board. He selects the Rhodes Scholars. He mentors them through their PhDs and then says, hey, Barry, you know, you're the best physicist I know. You're going to come teach physics. Lauren, you're the best entrepreneur business person I know. Uh, you're going to, in fact, our business person has an MBA from Wharton who teaches our course at Oxford. But, uh, who, you know, you're going to come teach business. So it's very small seminars. Uh, they, they're 12 students. They, they meet uh, uh, six days a week, including Saturday morning. Every student also takes a minor. It's a, an abbreviated version of a major, uh, three afternoons a week. And then there's all kinds of extraordinary activities that students and faculty help lead afternoons, evenings, and weekends, where we really dig in, some related to course content, some related to just learning as much as one can about the UK. Oxford Academia also offers a program at the American University of Paris, very similar but slightly different course themes. So you might also be able to take French language, obviously, in France. Uh, we have an amazing cuisine course there with amazing French chefs, uh, as well as other broad subjects. The seminars range from everything from business to the humanities, sciences, medicine, law, you name it. If you go to the website, you'll see the content there. Also, we also offer a program at the University of Siena, founded in 1240. We're the only program that they've ever admitted high school students for. Students enroll in the University of Siena, Siena in order to participate. And amazing uh, uh, seminars there, very similar. And you can mix and match these programs. You can either do four weeks, two two-week sessions at Oxford, Siena, or the American University of Paris, or you could do two weeks of study at Oxford and travel down with a group that's going to go down to Siena and do two weeks at the University of Siena, or up to Paris and do two weeks at the American College of Paris. So they're interchangeable, either two weeks or four weeks for really high achieving students who want to learn because they're dying to learn the subject matter, not because they're looking for grades, scores, and all the rest. We also have pre-college programs in Tokyo, Putney pre-college programs uh, at a university there, in Barcelona, uh, which is a fantastic program, and at Colby College right here in the state of Maine. So I think that sort of covers that waterfront, but I want to talk a little bit about our, our associations and our, and, our, uh, and our partnerships. So we run all of National Geographic's programs. It's called National Geographic Student Travel. To find it on the web, go to natgeostudenttravel.edu, or .org, .org, sorry. But they run a program at MIT in robotics and the science of robotics particularly emphasizing underwater robotics. That's a fascinating sh uh, short program. It's about two weeks where you work with MIT and Harvard professors to actually, you have to actually engage in building uh, your own units, uh, but it's a fascinating program. I also wanna touch on a program that we run in association with Harvard University with the School of Public Health, where I'm also a fellow and have done some teaching. And that program is really designed for students who are worried about the planet, want to ensure that they understand the science, the entrepreneurship, the media, the challenges of how you take passion around climate and put it to work. It was actually the brainchild of Gina McCarthy. Gina, uh, I mentioned I had a number of roles in, in life. One was serving three terms as governor of Vermont. When I served as governor here, Gina was the head of the EPA under Obama. And we worked closely together and got to know each other. We then, by pure chance, both ended up at Harvard. And it was this was pre-COVID, right before the COVID disaster, and all the high school students were striking on Friday, walking out of school. Uh, Greta was about to come over to the UN, give the give, you know give give him a piece of her mind on how slowly we're moving on climate. And Gina said, Peter, don't you work with high school students when you don't do all this stuff? I said, Yeah. She said, You know, Harvard's using its resources, amazing resources, uh, to help you know educate uh, un undergraduates and graduate students. All the actions come from middle and high school students. Let's take all of our resources. We'll cover that here. And you sort of, you know, do what you do with high school kids the rest of the time. And we're going to have the most amazing summit. So anyway, if you go to the Putney website, putney.com, which will be back up tomorrow, and hit pre-college Harvard, you'll see that program there. Finally, going back to Barry Stomping Grounds, Columbia University. Columbia has started... The, it, its first new school in about, I think, 50 years. It's called the Columbia Climate School. They're raising about a billion dollars to do it. They came to us and said, we want to take Columbia Climate School professors and put them up in the Green Mountain State, which is a real laboratory for clean green energy, 
and have our climate school there. It's called Columbia Climate School in the Green Mountains. And you have to just Google Columbia Climate School in the Green Mountains. It's on Columbia's website. And they select a roughly 120 students in a two-week program right here in Vermont at Castleton University, where they bring in Columbia professors. We help run the outside curriculum because obviously we have great contacts around Vermont, both political and energy-wise. And that's also a fascinating program. So that's a lot to fit into a few sound bites, Barry, but there's a lot out there. And there's a lot. And you know, we've had so many students do the Putney programs, the Wharton programs. And as I said earlier, um, I very intentionally selected our guests tonight because you can see the programs are quite frankly amazing. Um, and there, it's interesting because there are students who utilize, and this, these were some questions also that came up around just sort of pre-college and summer programming um, and the college process. There are some students who utilize summer as um, an extension of something they already are engaged in in some way during the school year. And the climate, I, we've had many students do the Harvard uh, P. Chan Climate Summit, um, things like that. They might be involved in their green club at school. They wanna take it to the next level. They're limited you know, in what they can do during the school year or in their, uh, in their home school. And they you know, kind of wanna extend something and then there's also um, the use of summer to start exploring something that you don't either have access to in the, in the school year or that you're just starting to figure out you might have an interest in. And sometimes the access has to do with opportunities that just don't exist close to home. Sometimes it's just a time thing. Like kids just don't have time until the summer to do these things. I would love to hear from each of you. Um, we always are encouraging students to pick their extracurricular activities, whether during the school year or the summer, um, around their interests, either ones that they want to extend or ones that they're looking to investigate and sort of start looking into. I would love to hear from each of you a little bit about for students who haven't had the experience already, um, you know, and don't have sort of uh, the opportunity to apply and say, hey, I'm already doing this, this and this, and now I want to come to your program and do more of it. But for the person who's kind of wanting to explore something or have their first opportunity, can you share just a couple of examples um, or pieces of advice for those kids who are younger and starting out or even older and making a pivot because they realize what they thought they were interested in uh, initially they're not. Um, what are the opportunities or what are a couple of opportunities that might be um, relevant and appropriate for, for those students sort of starting out? Um, and Lauren, if we could start with you. Yeah, absolutely. That is a great question. So at Wharton Global Youth, we have a, a program type called our Essentials Programs, and these are designed to be exploratory programs, right? So most students coming in have no foundational content knowledge in this specific area. They're all starting on a level playing field, and these programs offer a wide range of topics for students to be introduced to a variety of different disciplines and themes. Um, I think those are great for students who don't have any background or experience or just looking to dip their toes in the water because it's not a deep dive into one specific topic. If you apply for a three-week program in one very specific topic and find on day two you don't enjoy it, <laughs> you're kind of locked in for the rest of those three weeks. So doing something that is exploratory and allows an interdisciplinary approach to a content area or a discipline really allows you to kind of test out everything. Um, and utilize that summer. And if you love it, there tend to be more advanced programs you could do in a future summer. Um, so that's essentially how our programs are set up. Our essentials of entrepreneurship and essentials of finance are introductory, they're exploratory. And then we have more advanced programs for students who really enjoyed it and want to take the next step. Um, so those, those baby steps are really, really feasible for students who are looking to explore. Yeah, and that's actually great because I find so often, especially when students might say they have an interest in business, they don't always know quite what that means. And they're not even aware that there are, you know, so many different areas of focus or specialization. They just think business generally. Um, and so having the opportunity to have that wider exposure, you know, to the different um, the different subfields and the different areas of business and then figuring it out and then potentially whether returning to Wharton Global Youth um, for a more specific program in a subsequent year or heading on over to one of the careers programs at Putney, you know, or whatever. Um, so it's great to have that that option. And I do think especially for students 
interested in business because if you're applying to undergraduate business programs or if you're just applying generally to, you know, if it's a university where you don't necessarily apply into business, but you're going to say you have an interest in business, you need to be able to back that up. You can't just say, I'm interested in business. I find it fascinating. I watch the stock market. You know, I'm taking AP Econ and I'm finding it fascinating. That's not going to cut it. Um, so having the opportunity to have been exposed to a wide variety of things and then hopefully in a subsequent summer diving a bit more deeply in um, is wonderful. So thank you for sharing that. Peter, what about at Putney um, for students who are trying to figure it out? So, you know, we we have so much variety. If you go look at our website, you go, oh, my God, this is overwhelming. I mean, but remember that we start with sixth, seventh and eighth graders. In other words, we have middle school programs and high school programs. I don't know if you do more, but we, we divide them based upon their age. In other words, we wouldn't put a middle school kid with high school, obviously. Having said that, parents often call and say, well, you know, like, what, what, what should they do? What should they do? You know, they, they're torn between this and that. And I will say, I've learned, I've been doing this for over 40 years. And one thing I've learned, listen to your kid. This isn't what you want to do. It's what they're enthusiastic about. Any of these experiences are going to help in their, help you stand out in the respect that you know, there's a lot going on in college admissions now, and Barry, you know this better than anyone. But one thing I know is that in the 72 years that we've been making magic happen for students in the summertime, allowing them to explore, grow, learn, do the internships, get involved in, in hands-on learning in ways that schools just can't do in many cases. I know that there's never been a group of students who need this kind of experience, whether it's work or putting or whatever you're doing, now more than ever. Why? For the last, and this, I don't think there's been enough press about this, but for the last three, four years, these kids have missed so much opportunity in terms of being locked up, addicted to gadgets because they got told to go on Zoom to school, for God's sake, let alone everything else they do. Uh, anxiety, all the issues that, you know, when you think about that age group, we've always known that most of the growth that happens at that age between 13 and 17, much of it comes from the interactions with each other. And they missed a lot of that. So what I say to parents this year to your question is a little different than what I said to them pre-COVID. Now I say, listen, these kids and colleges know it because they're dealing with it when kids arrive as fresh people their first year and they need more psychological and other help than they did in the old days. They've been through a lot. Let them follow their passion. Let them follow their hearts and get away from the little cocoon at home, get away from your safety net, get out into the field with a new group of students, which is exactly what happens in college, and that's just gonna happen at Wharton or Putney, and build relationships, do the learning, get engaged, prove that you can not only do it, but succeed when you're doing it. And that's what colleges are looking for right now, in my view. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Peter. It's um. It's so important that students engage in whatever it is they're interested in, you know, academically, wherever you're shooting for, it's a pretty narrow space you need to be in to be sort of in that sort of qualified competitive, you know, sort of uh, group, um, again, regardless of where you're looking at um, college wise, but when it comes to extracurriculars, which ex obviously includes summertime. Um, it really is about what you're interested in. You know, the, what you choose, how you choose your curriculum during the school year, I wouldn't base it completely on just what you're interested in. You can might be able to take that into account a bit in your electives, but um, it wouldn't be wise to just say, because then I would, Peter, you said I might be the best physics student. So that's where my worst, I would be the worst physics student. <laughs> um, but for me, you know, I might, I have no interest in any of that, but it, it wouldn't necessarily be wise for me if I was a high school student to say, well, I really don't like, you know, science, or yeah. I really don't like math. So I'm just going to, you know, take it a little lighter there. Whereas in this for extracurriculars and summer activities, you really can and should follow yeah. your interest. You're going to take it higher. You're going to do more with it. You're going to engage better. You're going to be more excited. You're going to have more to say. And Absolutely. all of that comes through in your essays and applications and your interviews. And so if you're just kind of doing the thing you think you should be doing or they want you to do, you'll be like that example I gave earlier, where all you can really say is that you did it. You know, right. and, the, so and, the, and, the and the colleges will see right through that. And, you know, we're reading tens of thousands of applications and you have people who really do care about right. what they're doing and really are 
you know, I, I, um, I don't like to use the word passionate uh, because I think it's overused and kids can, can kind of connect, but really is truly passionate, loves what they're doing. And then you've got the person who kind of did it and did it because they know they needed to do it and, you know, just kind of went along. Um, there's no comparison. And so you might as well follow what you're interested in. And there really aren't value judgments in doing one thing versus another. And it wow. goes back to that first question also about doing a program that you pay for versus either that you don't or one that's more selective versus less selective. I've had so many students go to the most selective colleges in the country doing programs in the summer that anybody can just sign up and do. But what are you going to get out of it? That's what it's all about. I'm always amused by the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I'm always amused by the pay for question, because, of course, every college that students are applying for has a very large portion of folks who wouldn't be there if they couldn't pay for it. Uh, I want to emphasize that we have a robust scholarship fund, so some people pay and some people don't. Having said all that, um, you know, the way I, I bet Lauren does some of this, too, but the way we structure our program in terms of a lot of students when they're in high school, they don't know the answer, certainly middle school, to the question of what is my passion. So what we tend to do, at least in our Oxford Academia programs, is we say, hey, major in what you're really passionate about, but monitor, uh, minor in something that you have maybe curious about, maybe you're not, maybe your high school doesn't. You know, so if you're going to do uh, medicine as a major, go do creative writing, or go do poetry, or go do Shakespeare, something that's totally going to pull you out of what you would normally be doing, and you'll find out whether it's something you're excited about or not. And you can also do a program for two or three or four weeks and then do something else, right? Like, you know, and many programs, yeah, yeah, and many programs like yours do run between, you know, anywhere from one to four weeks um, so that students can do other things um, because oftentimes they do have either multiple interests or they might just want to ex do a little bit of exploration, a little bit of deep diving. Absolutely. Um, and that and, was and, a and, and you can mix and match organizations. I mean, we have students that go to work and then come to Putney and do a service project in Costa Rica or Ecuador or Tanzania or Vietnam, you know, after they've done more than before. Um, we actually had more students doubling up last year, probably because of the isolation of COVID and parents and students saying like, oh my God, just get me out of the house and get me back into the world. And we have it again this year. But we double up programs where a student might go do two weeks at Oxford and then go do service or go do an exploration program or something, go go up to the Arctic and, and focus on climate change and one of our climate programs at Columbia, whatever it is, uh, huge opportunities to mix and match it up. Yeah, we encourage mixing and matching as long as it makes sense with the profile. You don't want to do like three or four different things because how are you going to, that that seems wow. a little bit much, right? But if you do a couple of things and then actually also schedule some time to rest and recharge for the next year, we always encourage that as well. I think sometimes students and parents think that every week of the summer needs to be scheduled with a program. Um, we discourage that strongly, but you know, one or two things um, that might be that area of focus, either that you already know you have or that you're kind of experiencing exploring and searching for can be really great. And it's nice to sometimes have that balance. So it's um it's a good thing. Um, can we talk um just Lauren, I'd love to ask a question just as a follow-up going back a little bit. Um, there a lot of people will ask, particularly since it's a university-based program, um, does going to your pre-college program um impact or help in any way if you're applying to Penn as an undergraduate. Um, can you speak to that for our listeners? Sure. It's the million dollar question. <laughs> um, I, I think I always have to preface this response by saying I do not work for the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. I am not privy to their decision making process. That being said, I do conduct admissions for very selective summer programs at the Wharton School. Um, the profile of our candidates is not too far off from the undergraduate population. Um, and what, what I typically tell students and families is that, you know, these programs offer a host of benefits, uh, but you shouldn't be participating in these programs just to get your foot in the door. Right. First and foremost, every applicant to the institution has to meet the baseline admissions criteria. And if you've also done a program, well, that's the icing on the cake. But if you don't meet that baseline admissions criteria, you're, you're not going to go any further. Right. I mean, this program will still allow you to test out specific content areas, you know, see what it's like to live in the dorms and be on your own for a little bit, um, test out a new space. Um, 
and, and really explore a little bit on your own before you make the transition to your two or four year undergraduate institution. Um, but ultimately you shouldn't be participating in this program just for a, a leg up when it comes to college admissions. Um, but for students who are interested in attending Penn or interested in attending Wharton, I think some of the additional benefits of these programs is that you're working with faculty, you have insight into what it's like to be a student at the university, and you can really solidify that choice, that selection, or you may find the institution is not for you, it's not a good fit. Um, I think that's really the primary benefit of the program, right? Is this the right fit for you? Is business a good fit for you? Is Penn or Wharton a good fit for you? Is an urban institution a good fit for you? Um, so really finding the right fit is, is our primary focus. Um, but again, if you meet the baseline admissions criteria, you have a really robust resume, and this happens to be one of your additional extracurriculars, that's great, but there are thousands of students who have similar experiences as well. So it's really about refining all of those experiences, collecting them, um, and then painting a much larger picture for admissions. Yeah, and that, and then also sometimes it will come up where people will say, well, if I go to the Wharton program, but then I realize I want to go to some other, you know, peer institution, is that bad that I went to Wharton because I'm interested in X? Of course not, right? It goes back to what we talked about earlier. What did you get out of the program? If you're going to be able to speak about, you know, the substantive part of your experience, translate it to that other institution and their programming, it's great that you went to Wharton or wherever. Um, it's really going to be about how you communicate in those essays, um, what it, how, it, how it kind of changed and Im impacted who you are, what you want to study, what you want to do in the future, and even what you started to do after that, and whether it was 12th grade, 11th grade, you know, whatever. So um, it's not only specific to there. One other question, just because it came in, um, similar to the one I just asked, a little bit of an extension of it. Um, uh, I assume the answer is no, based on what you said, but it is also presumably the case that uh, when you apply as an undergraduate to Penn, that if you applied, whether you admitted or not to, let's say, a, a Wharton Global Youth Program, that that application is never um, part of the admissions process. They're never seeing any of those pieces. Is that right? That's a great question. Uh, they are completely separate admissions processes. Uh, undergraduate admissions does not have access to any of your previous experiences unless you explicitly bring them to their attention. Um, but I do just want to add that Wharton Global Youth Programs are now listed in the Common App. So for students who have participated in one of our programs, they can formally document their program participation um, through their common application in the education section. Um, so that would be a way to, to verify that you've participated in one of our programs, um, which is really great for any universities that might recommend demonstrated interest in a school. Um, Wharton does not, but it's always great to show that you have participated in, in programs like this. Yeah, what Lauren's referring to, there's an education section in the common application where it asks about um, programs on college or university campuses that you may have participated in, and there's a search and sort of pull down feature. And so Wharton Global Youth is appearing there, um, which is great because it gets confusing because you have a lot of the different options and students don't know which one to pick. So I'm glad that you did that. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Peter, I would love to hear, you glossed over it earlier, but the careers programs that you have are some of the most special, I think, um, that I've seen. And so could you speak about a couple of them? I don't think we'll have the time to get into all of them, but if you could speak about a few of them and just give our guests a sense of what sure. those offer, because I think those some of those are the coolest. Um, yes. So the career programs really are not classroom-based at all. You're in the field. It's very small, 16 to 18 students. Uh, with professors, special experts, and uh, any leaders. And an example, we have an amazing business of sports program in Barcelona. This is for students that are really into sports, obviously. We're using soccer, football in Spain as the medium, uh, but also want to understand the business of sports. We happen to have uh, a very close relationship for various reasons that I won't bore you with, with the um, one of the owners and uh, leaders of one of the most competitive uh, soccer leagues in Northern Spain in Barcelona. So our students actually get to go in, work with him, work with the team. You learn about recruitment. You learn about the business of managing a team. You learn about how you actually sign up players, how you win and lose in that game. And of course you play a lot of soccer, meet a lot of players, but it's just an intensive sort of like, would I wanna be involved 
maybe not as a player, but would I want to be involved in the business of managing the sports world? Another example far from it would be Germany and Sweden, the future of cars, where students spend time with the cunning edge folks at Mercedes-Benz, at Porsche, at Volvo, at VW, who are building out uh, the technology and the, and the and competitiveness to compete in the, uh, in the not only self-driving, but obviously electric car world. So there is just entirely for car people, students that think they are car geeks that want to be, uh, and an example there is, we had a student do that program last summer, a girl who uh, really dug in to the design of electric vehicles, asked lots of great questions when she was with some of the senior managers at Volvo, and is going back next summer to Sweden uh, to work together uh, with them. They were so impressed by her, and she's going to be in the labs helping to design cars next year. So that's the kind of experience where it's career, meaning you have access to people that you just wouldn't have if you were studying behind a classroom, you know, look staring at books, whatever it is. Uh, a final example would be, I'm into public health. We have an amazing program in Peru where you're actually working with providing service uh, in the field, learning about both the healthcare system in Peru, what works, what doesn't. You're in small rural communities where you're delivering care and you'll get a real sense of some of the challenges that developing countries are facing around COVID, around other epidemics, around the challenges of climate change and what that means for public health. So these are in the field experiences where you really get to dig into something that you think you might be interested in and you want to know more, but you don't want to be at Oxford or you don't really want to be at work with professors and classroom kind of or seminar kind of structure, but you want to be out in the field learning and throwing away the books. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've had several students do the, the food farm to table. Uh, yeah, well, we had an amazing farm. Them. I couldn't go through them all. We I know. There, I, said, I know. I know. That we, have, we have a limited uh, amount. I have to tell you an anecdote about farm to table while I get here, because the stories of the kids is why we do this. So one kid goes and does our farm to table program. Major. They're working with the original, they claim to be the original family, going back of eight generations that developed gelato in Italy. The kid gets so into this, I'll, I'll leave his name on out of this one, that he comes back. You can Google, you, you got his New York Times and other stories about it. Comes back, buys a hot dog court, converts it to, to gelato, starts it while he's going to, I think he went to Fieldston or Horse Man, I can't remember which. And 11th grade starts the gelato, it goes crazy. The Chinese restaurant goes out of business. So he rents that, starts to, he's running a gelato business while he's going to high school and applying. He went to Harvard in the end, but I imagine he's at business school by now. This is four years ago. But anyway, great stuff happened. Yeah, no, it's it's super it's super interesting. Um, and you know, we're talking a little bit about what happens in the classroom and the hands-on learning outside of the classroom and both in programs at, in both places. Um, but there's also the part outside of sort of the academics or hands-on learning experience, whether in a dorm or evening or weekend activities. Um, can you each speak to sort of, um, and I know that it'll be different depending what type of program maybe um, you're in or what age a student is, but if you could give us a general sense about sort of that balance between, let's call it class time, whether it's in a traditional classroom or not, but class time versus free time and structure versus unstructured, um, you know, just to just to have a sense of the broader um, social experience beyond the learning. Um, and if we could start with you, Lauren, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So our academic classes are typically held Monday through Friday from nine to five with some variation depending upon the specific program. Occasionally there are site visits or guest speakers and that schedule changes. Um, outside of class hours, uh, we offer a cross-program lecture series where we invite Wharton faculty to come in and present on their research and their teaching, which is a really great way to expose students to lots of different topic areas and really cool cutting-edge research that they wouldn't necessarily learn about in their specific program. Um, so again, just a very interdisciplinary, very integrated approach, um, full exposure to everything Wharton offers. And then beyond that, we have a host of extracurricular and social activities we offer for students. Um, some are more structured than others. Occasionally, we will take students to historic or cultural sites throughout Philadelphia, museums. Um, we will do weekend trips as well on Saturdays to um, uh, amusement park or King of Prussia Mall, which tends to be a huge hit. Who doesn't love a mall? <laughs> um, 
and again, more Philadelphia sites, just soak up all the history. Um, but most of these activities are offered on an optional basis because there's also the opportunity to explore Center City with your newfound friends, to explore campus. Um, and then of course, as students move into the final week of their program, they're often working with their small group on a final culminating capstone project. Um, so they often wanna reserve that time for more focused efforts. Um, but again, they have access to the full campus, they can explore, um, we have lounge spaces throughout the dorms and in all of our academic buildings. Um, so they very much get that college going experience where your time is your own to manage. Um, that means you get yourself to class at 9 a.m. <laughs> you get yourself to dinner before it closes. Um, and that's definitely part of the experience. Um, but we do also offer students the option of creating their own activities. So we do a lot of pickup sports. And if they find a concert in the area they want to go to, we're more than happy to purchase tickets and provide transportation as long as it's within reason. Um, so again, we offer them some structured activities and the flexibility to create their own um, opportunities as well. And um, when I was there one summer doing a visit, um, it seemed that the pre-college students, even the ones beyond Wharton Global Youth, but they were all together um, fairly concentrated in a certain area in the residential uh, uh, buildings. Is that still the case where the pre-college students, either in their own program or maybe with some associated other programs, that they're they're generally housed together? It really varies from summer to summer, depending upon which residence halls are available, and we don't necessarily get to make that selection. Um, we do often keep we always keep minors in residence halls with only minors um, just for, for safety purposes. Um, but we could have programs that are spread across campus depending upon, again, what's available. Okay, great. And then Peter, um, a little bit about the structure outside of the- Yeah, the so, so I mean, those are really important questions that you're asking because you know parents often ask you know, two things that they worry about. One is what are the other students gonna be like? We have a selective admissions process, just like Lauren, where we try weed out students that would create problems that none of us want to or train to deal with. Uh, we have pretty high standards of admissions. But the most important question is, who is actually in charge and who is actually making sure that my student is loved in the same way that I love them back home? In other words, there are things that are great to do and there are things you cannot do. And who's, who's doing that? And the answer, I always like to say, hey, listen, we've been doing this for 72 years. Everyone's always come home happy and alive. We plan to keep it that way. But there's a reason for that. We don't engage college students in our staff. They have to be at least graduate student age. We don't let students come to a pre-college program, as an example, and go to class with a fantastic professor and then have a bunch of kids, college kids, running sort of the rest of what happens. So we actually require our deans, our directors, James Basker lives in the dorms at Oxford, uh, our, all of our faculty that aren't on, that, that, are, that, are, that are not, you know, that are not housed at Oxford, CNN, wherever we are, uh, to live with the students, to be part of their daily lives, afternoons, evenings, and weekends. So we have a real, there's a group meeting every night in any Putney, National Geographic, Smithsonian program, and Columbia, Harvard, you name it. And at that meeting, that's where faculty and students offer all kinds of op options for the afternoons, evenings, and weekends. But in those larger programs, you can't just sort of like sit in your dorm room and, and do your computer. You've got to get involved. We expect that not only are you going to participate in seminars, but you have to participate. I mean, occasionally you can just go out with friends and sit in the park or take a rest if you're really tired. But if you were doing that three or four days in a, in a row, one of your deans or someone would talk to you and say, hey, Barry, what's the program? Come on, this is a great opportunity. I'm going down to Hyde Park. I'm going down here with this group of students. Come with me and away you go. We also have students help organize activities they're excited about, a cricket match, a play up in London, uh, you know, whatever it is. So in these larger group experiences and the small ones where you like a family, it is quite structured in a respect that you have to do something. You can't just sort of like go stare at your gadget and be isolated alone and unhappy. So we find that the growth from that group experience is as important as everything else that you're learning during the summer. And a good and happy summer doesn't happen unless you have a lot of friends, new friends, a lot of people that really care about you, 
and strict rules, no drugs, no drinking, no cigarettes, no all the obvious stuff, uh, and a really wholesome community where the simple rules are respected and enforced, and we're all in it to have a very positive, clean, great summer. Terrific. Now for students um, who want to apply to the programs, um, both applications are now open. Um, can you just give, um, if there is any, you know, deadlines or any um, advice, like, is it better to apply earlier? Um, are you doing kind of rolling admission? Just sort of a general overview of for students um, who are interested in applying for counselors who might want to recommend the, the programs. Um, Lauren, if we could start with you, uh, let us know how it works over at Wharton. Sure. So the we offer a priority deadline, which is January 25th, and decisions will be released in early March. And then our final deadline is April 5th, and decisions are released at the end of April. Um, we do encourage students to apply by the priority deadline. For most of our programs, we offer multiple sessions. Um, so, for example, our two-week program actually runs four separate sessions over the course of the summer. So if you have a very packed summer schedule um, and can only participate in one session, we definitely encourage you to apply by the priority deadline. Certain programs, certain sessions will absolutely fill. Um, if we have seats available in remaining sessions and programs, we will continue to accept applications through the final deadline, but there's no guarantee. Um, and then, of course, any international students are very strongly encouraged to apply by the priority deadline just to ensure there is time for visa processing and any additional transportation needs they might need to make in advance of programming. Terrific. What about a Putney? So all of admissions, even with our collaborators, Harvard, Smithsonian student travel, National Geographic student travel, Oxford Academia, uh, Columbia Climate School, all the admissions runs through Putney. It's a rolling admissions process. You go to the website for that particular program, you hit apply now, you fill out the form, which anybody can do, mom, dad, student, it takes about seven minutes, it's all basic information. And you make a $700 deposit on Visa or MasterCard. Then we write back and say, yes, we have space or no, we don't. If we don't, we call you or get involved, trust you about whether you have second choices. If you do, if we do have space, we write back and say, we have space and we're gonna hold that space for you. Then it's up to the student to get involved and they have to provide us with the emails of two teachers that know them well. Obviously, if they're applying for a language program in France, one of them has to be a language teacher, Spanish, whatever it is. But particular criteria around the, the, the teachers we're gonna reach out to. You then have to write an essay. It's not your college essay, but it's three or four paragraphs explain, telling us more about you and why we should select you. Then you go to admissions as soon as that information is complete. If you're in, away we go. If you're not, we credit that $700 on your credit card and suggest that maybe you try to reapply the next year. Warning for the wise, and I'm sure Lauren would say the same, for whatever reason, we are slammed with applications. We have more than we've had in our 72 year history. And therefore we have wait lists. For example, we already have wait lists for several programs uh, and they're just gonna continue to grow. So I have to say to the East Coasters, you know this, hurry up, you know, you're in good shape. You know to be uptight and worried about this and get right on out of Thanksgiving. To those out in other parts of the world and other countries, California in particular, don't be laid back California because the Easterners are gonna grab your places. Now, they won't live as long because they're much more uptight and hypertensive, but they're gonna have much better summer experiences. So wake up out there and get to work. Well, we always start talking about summer, like I said, as the weather's changing. And for some, it feels too early, but we know that it's not too early because. Right a lot of programs are similar and that they do start to fill up. So, well, thank you so, so much to both of you for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure to chat. Um, thanks for the questions that came in both before the webinar and also during our conversation. Um, we were answering some off, uh, offline and then also integrating some of those questions into our conversation. Um, but these have been um, really great insights and I think everyone can tell why um, these were two programs that we wanted to highlight and talk about, um, both offering some really, really unique programming, all of it substantive, all of it um, wonderful for students where the interests match or where you might be interested in exploring. So we know this is the start of the busy time for you. Um, it's start of the slower time for us, I'm happy to say. Um, as, uh, yeah, as the early decision stuff comes out and we're done with the essays and everything for regular decision, but um, we're excited already for summer 2023 and, and thank you again for, for joining.
Thanks for having us. And Barry, thanks to you and Will and the expert admissions team. You, you all really are great at what you do, and we appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. Same back, right back at you. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. Nice Absolutely. to meet you, Take care, everybody. Have a good night.